for those who just arrived to this Media Mastermind session, good morning and welcome. My name is Jerome Delay, the head of the entertainment division at Twin Medium. We just had a fantastic session with Dan Rose from Facebook, so if you missed it, you can watch it on our website, bipcop.com. But now, this is the time for our second Media Mastermind keynote of the day, and we are honored to welcome Francis Berrick, president of Bravo and Oxygen Media, we will sit down for a conversation with Kevin McClellan, chairman of NBC Universal International. Kevin is responsible for day-to-day -day operation and international expansion for NBC Universal businesses outside of North America, including theatrical, home entertainment, and television. Kevin also works with respective international leaders to drive growth for CNBC International, Telemundo International, Parks and Resorts, and NBC News. Additionally, Kevin supports Comcast Overseas Expansion Strategy and serves on NBC Universal Executive Committee. Before we ask Francis to join us on stage, please join me in welcoming Kevin McClellan. Um, I'm very honored to be here today uh, at MIPCOM. I'm very familiar with the market. I've been here a number of times, and I'm always pleased to come back. I must admit, though, when I agreed to do this initially, um, to, introduce my friend, to uh, interview my friend and colleague, Francis Berwick, I actually thought to myself, how hard could this be? I get to ask the questions for a change. I don't have to answer them. And then I come up here, and there's this stage with all these lights and this smoke. And I start thinking, this feels a bit like executive X Factor, actually. So it's a little bit more intimidating than I thought. But I promise I will not break out in any song today. Um, I would like to introduce, give you a little introduction to your main speaker today, who is Frances Berwick. As I said, I'm honored to be her friend and her colleague at NBC Universal. Frances has a long history with MIPCOM. She's actually been coming to the market for a really long time, which I'm sure we'll hear, hear a little about. She used to be the head of distribution for Channel 4 in the UK, actually. So she did licensing and distribution here. So she's been to many MIP and MIPCOMs. In 1996, Francis moved over to the Bravo network in the United States. At the time, it was a little-known network that focused on arts programming and movies and actually had no advertising whatsoever. Um, as a result of Francis's leadership, they began to develop and produce their own programming. So many of the hits that they produced under Francis's leadership were Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, Inside the Actors Studio, Top Chef, Project Runway, and Real Housewives. As a result of all of these hits, Bravo has become a top 10 network in the United States. It has the most engaged and educated audience across pay TV in all of the United States. I know some of you internationally won't be familiar with the Bravo network because it actually doesn't exist outside the US. But what I'd like to do then is to show you a clip so that you can become more familiar with the network, and then we can speak to Francis. So ladies and gentlemen, the Bravo network. Can we roll the clip? Are you ready? Put your hands up. It's yeah. all right. Everyone has a passion. And for affluencers, they're passionate about everything Bravo. And that means food, fashion, beauty, design, digital, and pop culture. This is awesome. Bravo viewers don't just watch our content, they live it. They're thinking about Bravo, talking about it, interacting with it, sharing it, and swearing by it. I love this! We've unveiled a brand new slate of programming our fans will be passionate about. Who wants to call this home? Bravo's bringing together passionate property experts to swoon over the most lavish homes in the world. I wouldn't love that. Then they'll guess the outrageous price on Property Envy. Whoa! Whoa! Grammy Award winner and Real Housewives of Atlanta star Candy Burris and a team of experts are giving two people a chance at superstardom. Oh, boom, yes. She'll crown a winner every single week in this music competition series. The Candy Factory. Bring the action. Dive into the lives of these mega yacht crew members as they serve the wealthy and demanding. Remove this part of the ship for me. It's blocking my son. I'm below deck. The best summer city in the world. From one sizzling city to the next, Bravo's following Chicago's It Crowd. During the summer, you work hard and you play hard. It's 100% drama on 100 Days of Summer. Manischewitz! These six Long Island princesses are living at home waiting for their Prince Charming. <laughs> princesses Long Island. 
It's crunch time for these two entrepreneurs as they try to transform their hugely successful YouTube channel into a fitness revolution. <laughs> On Toned Up. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Own it. I'm really impressed. <laughs> well, thank you. Never gets old. An unprecedented 17 original series and 18 returning. It's a whole lot more for our affluencers to love. Find your passion this year. Bye, Bravo. These wings are made to fly. Ladies and gentlemen, the architect of Bravo, Ms. Frances Berwick. Hashtag hello. <laughs> in case um, you were in the last session. Yes, hi, Frances. I, um, I'm very happy to be here today with you. And as I said to the audience before, this is not your first MIPCOM or your first time at the rodeo, as they say. No, I have to say I admitted to Kevin, I think I was a high school student. I admitted to Kevin that I came to the first MIPCOM, which I think was in 1987. Um, it was marked by the fact I was a very junior sales assistant and a Canadian buyer made me cry. And I was sort of <laughs> thinking, if the politest nation in the whole world can make me cry. Probably if it was a New Yorker, I would have turned into a nurse or done complete career change. <laughs> um, I've never actually heard of a Canadian making somebody yeah. cry, so. Um, what's changed at MIPCOM? Well, there are about sort of four people here. You didn't have to make dinner reservations, and I had a, even though I was a very junior person, I had a sea view in the Grand Hotel. So I, you know, I thought I'd arrived in heaven and then cut to sort of two or three years later and then you know, we were all scrabbling around for rooms in small hotels on the Rue d'Antibes. So <laughs> changed very quickly. Well, we're very happy to have you back. Let's talk a little bit about Bravo. Yes. So as you can see from the reel, everybody, Bravo consists of all unscripted programming. Yet somehow, you've been able to make the network a top 10 in the US. Yeah. Typically, many people make the assumption that a top 10 network needs to be more general entertainment, which usually means scripted drama or comedy. How have you bucked the trend for Bravo? Well, I mean, we have bucked the trend because we are the only network in the in sort of top 10 cable entertainment in the US that, that has only reality. And I would say, you know, it's hard. We've done it um, by sort of quality, first and foremost, I think, for a long time unscripted or reality shows were considered to be lowest common denominator programming and I think that what we've managed to prove and you know many other producers have proved this that you know just as with scripted there's high and there's low quality there's you know very well produced shows and less well produced shows I think with reality you know there's all kinds of standards and you know, I think what we've tried to do, by virtue of having a very, very educated audience, we've set the, the bar very high. So we have sort of quality unscripted shows. And then secondly, it's, it's about quantity. So over the last five years, we've probably gone from having about 150 original hours a year to um, over 500 now, which translates into 35 original series that vary from, you know, eight hours to 22 hours. So we're in sort of constant year-round rolling out series, and for fourth quarter alone, we have um, nine that we are either you know returning series or, or new ones we're launching. Um, and then I think the third thing is we've we've tried to really go for brand consistency, so that when you turn on the network, you know you're watching Bravo immediately, and that's done with a variety of sort of tools and tricks. Um, you know, the shows are all different. They have different people in them. They're different genres. We have some self-contained reality and some competition and some, you know, a lot of uh, sort of docudramas with different characters. But we, we, we do sort of some very specific things that keep the brand consistent. We take a very sort of unjudgmental tone. So we don't editorialize. Our viewers are smart enough that they can reach their own conclusions. And so we never have voiceovers, or all, almost never have voiceovers, which I think is a little different. And it's certainly different from most other networks in the US. And so we let our viewers take away what they want to take away. And I think you get sort of different reactions. So some people find our characters, frankly, ridiculous. And other people really relate to them and um, you know, might be amused by them, might even find them role models, while other people you know, are sort of judging them. And so they're, they're taking their own um, viewpoints away. Um, and I think there's also what we sort of call internally, there's a bit of a bravo wink, that we like to have a lot of irony, that the shows are generally fun or funny, but you know, we're not adding laugh tracks, we're not telling people um, you know, what they should find funny, but 
some of the behavior is quite exaggerated and extreme, but these are real people, you know, living their lives. Mm. So. I think many people here at MIPCOM deal with similar networks around the world, and so one of the questions that I hear a lot is how do you ramp up the amount of original programming that you do from yeah. sm such a small amount exponentially over sort of a five or seven year period, yeah. and how do you do that from a cost perspective? cost perspective. <laughs> um, well, it's, you know, it's hard. I mean, it, what we've done, it's, it's been a sort of relatively gradual, but in some years we've increased our hours by about 20%. So we've had years where we've sort of really driven it, but we work, I mean, we work like a publishing house. So we have, um, you know, maybe 10 or 12 internal producers who are supervising a lot of outside production. And we are we're pretty hands-on, we're very involved in the production, you know, whether that's either going on set or sitting in edits, and, and that's really done to sort of maintain this consistency that we look for. But, um, you know, in terms of cost, I mean, you, you touched on scripted, and we're certainly starting to develop scripted for Bravo because we feel like that's the next stage in our evolution. The, the, the cost of reality is still a fraction, not even sort of 20%, sometimes 15% of the cost of scripted. So it's a lot less risky. We can do what we call pilot series, you know, six episodes, uh, you know, and still, you know, make a profit on those if we, if we sort of promote them right and we give them the right lead in to them. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the cost of scripted is just so extreme that you know, you have to take a pause be before getting there, and we do feel like we're mature enough to, to go into that world. Um, so do you think, I mean, it, se it sounds like a big risk for a network that has a great model. You're a top 10. Are you entering into scripted because you don't think you can maintain those audiences with unscripted? I think it's because we feel like we need to diversify, and just as we're exploring other areas of unscripted, looking at different genres of unscripted, we're spending a lot of time on topical and um, interactive shows, live shows, um, and you know, introducing more and, mo more and more of those to the network. Um, we, f we feel like scripted is, you know, it is a way to create more longevity. Uh, and I think there's, a, there's something about reality shows that makes them very ephemeral. The audience for them are incredibly fickle. They want to move on to the next thing. And even though you can point to a dozen reality shows that have had incredible staying power, like The Survivors and The um, American Idols, and for us, you know, shows like Top Chef and Real Housewives. That's not the norm. A lot of reality sort of comes and goes very quickly, and then the next thing burns very brightly. You look at the sort of numbers that MTV saw on Jersey Shore, but it's sort of not sustainable, and you know, in a for, for many many years. So scripted feels like you can continue those for a lot longer. They still have more worth on the international market, which is you know, an important revenue, revenue stream. Um, although I would say that you know, your team has done an incredible job in terms of selling, licensing our shows internationally and our formats internationally. That leads me to another question. I get, I'm often asked by buyers and people who run networks, the affiliates, the MVPDs, why is it that Bravo and Oxygen don't exist outside the United States, like so many other American networks? Well, Bravo actually did for a while. Um, we had two networks in South America. We had a, a, a Bravo Brazil that was a partnership with Globo, and we had a, a network called Film and Arts. We launched them in the 90s, and the, when the economy was incredibly volatile in those markets, and we just got skittish, and we sold them. Uh, we sold them off to our partners, even though you know, we, we had a majority holding. And with Bravo Canada, that, you know, that was a sort of trademark license. But um, it's been for a variety of reasons. I think partly because Bravo as a channel name is used by many other, you know, it was already in use by um, other networks or other media conglomerations in other markets, so we couldn't clear the name, including in the UK, where, um, you know, it was, I don't think it's, um, it still exists right now, but it was a very male-targeted tar network. Um, we've always been sort of very much male and female, but with a slightly heavier concentration of females in the US. Um, and then I think secondarily, it's because we've done very well in terms of licensing our shows. And so it then became a question of which is the best way to go. Should we license 
and have our product on a variety of networks in each market, or do we want them sort of concentrated in one place? Um, well, but uh, there's an interesting deal in Australia where yes. you actually license the packaging of the channel yeah. and all of the content, but not the actual brand name itself. Yeah. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, I mean, that's sort of the gold standard, I think, in terms of sort of partnerships. We have a relationship with Foxtel in, in Australia where there is a channel called Arena that basically looks like Bravo, but with a different name. And so we've worked very closely with, with the folks at Arena so that the, the they use our branding. They just, instead of having a talk bubble with Bravo in it, they have a talk bubble with Arena in it. Um, they have a very high volume of our content, and the networks feel very much the same. We share a lot of the promotional materials, so it, it sort of creates a lower cost base for them. And the network does you know, really, really well, but it's a very, very similar audience to the audience that we have in the US, where they, you know, it's the most upscale, the most educated, very, very engaged audience, very sort of tech savvy. Um, and you know, we're now, as we create an increasing amount of digital content, you know, that's another way that we can sort of um, share the content. So you create a number of shows, and maybe that's why licensing is more appealing than perhaps taking the channel outside the, the United States, but you create a number of shows that have become really franchises. Mm -hmm. So you've got Top Chef and Real Housewives, yeah. and those shows are being produced all over the world, thousands yeah. of episodes a year. You know, my group sells the, yeah. the formats to those. Um, one of the questions that I, that I get frequently from buyers is, how do you keep a franchise like that fresh and engaging for the audience? Because they have been running for many years. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, Top Chef is, uh, we just launched season 11 in the US and it continues to do incredibly well. It's a lot of time spent on casting because these shows live and die by how good the cast are, you know, the charismatic characters that jump off the screen. Um, we spend on a competition show like Top Chef or any of the spin-offs from Top Chef, like Top Chef Masters, we spend an awful lot of time really, really thinking about the challenges and making them feel really different from the year before. We work very closely with the producers on that. On Real Housewives, we do something that has a double benefit, and that's with each, you know, we have six cities around the US with their casts, and we, um, we air them for about each city. So Real Housewives of Beverly Hills will air for four months and then we don't bring that back for another year. And so people are sort of craving seeing these, what feel to them like old friends coming back, you know, and it's a year later. But we often introduce, we'll change out cast members. And that has, you know, I would say the double benefit of sometimes our cast believes that, you know, they're very, very important to the show and they start demanding these sort of very, very high salaries, and there comes a point. I'm sure, in which nobody it's here not, can relate with that. Nobody by the can way. hear it's a difficult talent. Yeah. And so, by sort of changing them out, we can also sort of, you know, manage that too. But we're able to introduce new universal themes, things that are going on in these different women's lives, whether that's being empty nesters for the first time, or having marital issues, or and we can mix up the storylines a lot that way by bringing these new characters and sort of keeping the show feeling young and fresh. Um, there's also, you know we want to keep the shows within a certain median age, late 30s, early 40s, and you know, we can bring in sort of you know, new and younger characters from time to time that way too. Do you look for formats while you're here at MIPCOM? I mean, I know you yes. haven't been here for a long time, but do you send people, are there foreign formats that interest you, and is that become a much more competitive space in the United States? Yeah, I mean, I think the formats world has always been important. We're much more interested in that right now. We, we always you know, send people to look for them. We have people here from Bravo and Oxygen who are doing specifically that. Um, we just launched a show last night, too early for me to have even got the overnights, um, overnight ratings for it, called, which we're calling The People's Couch, but is a UK format called Gogglebox, which is literally watching people watching TV. And it's a sort of socio-anthropological experiment, but it's the, the UK show was absolutely hilarious. And you know, we debated, should we just sort of air the UK one because it was people watching TV and it was actually sort of fascinating to see inside these different homes. So you know, that, that was a format that there was um, a you know, competitive situation on. There were a couple of other networks that wanted it. And so- That sounds like a show I'd like to star in actually because <laughs> uh, I'm quite the TV watcher. I don't know, there's sort of like a, a 
this one couple that just sort of is getting more and more trashed as they're watching TV and making Again, a show content. I'd like to star in, actually. That works for me. <laughs> um, but we have, you know, we also, we look everywhere for our format. So one of the big successes we had this year was a completely new format that came out of a division of NBC Universal, so I can feel free to plug it, which was Mon Monkey Kingdom. And it was a show called Newlyweds the First Year, which basically sort of took a step back. It feels like a much more traditional type of documentary. And we followed four couples from literally the week before they got married and for the entirety of the first year. There was a lot of personal video stories where they would record each other or they would record themselves when we didn't even have cameras there. And it worked really, really well. It's sort of the intense time when a lot of marriages are either going to make it or fall apart. Um, there's a lot of anxiety over money and geographic situation and having kids. And the show did very well for us. And we just, you know, we're announcing today we're picking up a second season of that. But the format is very, very solid, very simple, but, you know, worked really, really well. And it was highly relatable. So let's talk a little bit about marketing. Bravo is known, in the U.S. anyway, for being incredibly affluent, but also focusing on pop culture. So those are two things that it's, has proven to be very um, a, a appealing to the advertisers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of the, the killer two connection, and it's really hard to do. Most people don't put affluent and pop culture together. How do you think Bravo's been able to maintain that? Well, I think, you know, it, there's, a, there's a young, educated audience that, that wants that sort of pop culture and you know we think of ourselves as lifestyle and entertainment which is unusual usually networks sort of fall in one or other bucket and we we program around sort of specific uh, what we call our passion points of food fashion beauty design digital and pop culture and so pop culture is a a piece of that um, when we market to them um, you know we're very focused there's been such a shift in traditional media and traditional marketing and it really the old rules no longer apply and it's sort of like we a traditional campaign for us used to be we do out of home we buy local sometimes national cable um, and we'd have a print campaign and now it, it's sort of the interesting thing people don't look unless you're driving you're often not looking out the window at the bus shelters or the side of buses you're you know it's, sitting, reading, you know, your texts or your Blackberries, and it's sort of like the old rules don't apply. So the focus of most of our marketing now is very much about digital and social. We get our viewers to be our marketers. So if they're already fans of the network or fans of the shows, we get them to spread out the word by, you know, leveraging Facebook. We'll often release early clips to our Facebook followers and Facebook fans, um, you know, to give them a, a sneak peek, and they'll then push that out for us. And so the the amount of impressions that we can get very cost effectively is just sort of you know exponential. We use um, Twitter a lot and Tumblr and Instagram, and you know, we, we actually yeah. guys just so you know we we're speaking of digital since yes. you're moving on to the thing we have a clip about Bravo's digital business, and um, this is perhaps one of the most. Uh, admirable things about the network. So not only is it rating as a top 10 network, but it is certainly one of the most influential networks in the US in terms of social media and digital. So if we're gonna, we have a clip that maybe we can turn to, guys. Are you ready? Bravo leads the way in the social space by consistently pioneering first-to-market opportunities. Extending our presence on all the social media heavy hitters. Yes! <laughs> Our growth and engagement on Facebook has turned the platform into a major driver for brand awareness and tune into our programming. Facebook alone has accounted for over 6.8 million clicks to BravoTV.com. And with over 9.2 million fans across all our pages, our fan community grew 28% in 2012. <laughs> if Facebook is our constant marketing juggernaut, Twitter swoops in to provide Bravo fans with real-time engagement during our shows. And we reward our most vocal fans every week when at the Bravoholic Twitter handle plucks a super fan from obscurity and puts them in the spotlight as our digital correspondent. I love this! Not only does Twitter allow us to directly engage with the audience, but it also helps us to innovate ad sales integrations such as the Around the World in 80 Plates Tweet Challenge for Infinity and the Bravo Talk Bubble for Panera Bread. Wow, this is juicy. With over 9 million followers across our official Bravo brand and Bravo Liberty handles, plus an average yearly growth of 218% for Bravo on Twitter, 
Bravo stays connected with fans who love to share. It's about passion. And then there's Bravo Social Editions, where we collect tweets and posts and air them during repeat episodes. Social Editions perform an average of 14% higher. This is packing a good punch. Plus, Second Screen keeps the real-time social conversation alive with producer commentary, memes, and e-commerce opportunities. Hey, the party started! How much do our fans love us? When we asked them, we found out that Bravo ranks number one out of over 30 networks for recognizing and showing appreciation for its viewers. Really? Right here. That's so gangster. But it doesn't end there. 89% say Bravo gives viewers the opportunity to interact with other viewers and its shows creating water cooler moments and a super serving of social conversation. That's Social by Bravo. So the first question I have as somebody who's run a bunch of networks myself is it looks like a lot of work and it looks expensive <laughs> to do all of that. So does it pay for itself, all yes. of the social networking and digital yes, work I mean, that you do? A lot of the, the shiny new toy digital products that we roll out, we try and work with our you know, advertising brand partners on those. That reel mentioned something that we did with um, Infinity, sort of car company, where we had a show that traveled around the world. It was a cooking show. And so what we did was a sort of Twitter contest where over the, a period of about 48 hours, we kept giving clues on Twitter about the location of an Infinity that whoever got to the Infinity car first was going to win it. And so, you know, first of all, it narrows it down to a state in the US, then it narrowed it down to a city, and we would sort of give more and more clues. And then, you know, we then had the, you know, video camera waiting to take the shot of the people running towards the car as the final clue got revealed. And we did that sort of for each, ep each week that the uh, episode of this Around the World in 80 Plates mm. aired. So we try and work with advertisers as much as possible, but I also think. Um, you know, a lot of these things don't cost a lot of money. I mean, we created something called Social Buy where we wanted to drive ratings for our repeat airings. You know, we'll air a show four or five times in a week after we premiere it. And we want to drive those repeat ratings. So we, you know, we put up on screen some of the Twitter comments that we got when the, when the show was first airing in premiere. And what, what we found, you know, it sort of like seems like the simplest idea. People like seeing their Twitter handle or their name up on screen. And hashtag. so it would, it would hashtag yeah. exactly. So it would really drive viewing. And, you know, we're about to do the same thing with Instagram with a thing called InstaFan, fan, where we'll put up sort of little pictures during the repeat airings in the corner of the screen. And things like that are sort of very, very simple to do, but really sort of drive repeat viewing and, and you know, help raise the numbers. Um, and the other thing that, because we get measured in the US on both the rating of the show and the commercial and the rating through the commercial break, we're very, very motivated to try and sort of drive that engagement through the commercial breaks. And what we found with all these sort of second screen interactivity, we're, we're retaining viewers much more effectively through the breaks. So even though we have very, very educated viewers and you would think, they would know to fast forward, they're actually stopping and, it, and act watching the commercials because they're still engaged with the sort of the second screen interactivity that we're putting up during the show. Okay. So we're running out of time, but I, I do want to, by the way, I, all these cards, I've finished my cards, which is great. I did my homework, by the way. I just want people, well, somebody did my homework for me and, I was, and they were nice enough to give me these cards. But um, let's talk about nonlinear and SVOD, right? So is this the golden age of SVOD? And if so, is that a good thing for a channel like yours, or is that a challenging thing for particularly unscripted content? There's definitely the challenge of there's an explosion of content, both scripted and unscripted. The idea that Netflix are doing entire series, they're not piloting, they're going straight to series, you know, that creates a very, very competitive marketplace because, you know, creative talent wants wants to do that. You know, there's much less risk. Um, so I would say it's a golden age for TV. I don't know, you tell me if it's a golden age for, for SVOD. I mean... Well, I, I, I think it's hard to call it the golden age because it's kind of the genesis, right? It's just at the very beginning. It's a nascent business. It's brand new. And from my perspective, I think we're sort of... It's not that different from linear networks, right? When they first launched, they right. sort of launched with big general entertainment channels that drew a lot of people to it. So you might look at Netflix as being something along those lines, right? 
And as far as I'm concerned, it will start to niche out and you will see nonlinear options for people that are actually driven by more niche audiences. So it could be anything from golf to pop culture. You know, but people are going to need pathfinders to help find their way through the nonlinear world. And, and I think brands like Bravo are the perfect type of brand to do that for them. Yeah, and you know, the other thing that's interesting right now, a lot of, um, a lot of SVOD is about movies and it's about scripted shows. I think the next phase will be sort of seeing what the opportunities are for unscripted because there's a very, very passionate fan base for these shows. That's why they're so successful on TV. So I, I and the big SVOD players are not focusing on that right now, right? So their marketing is not about that. They're not going right. for niche audiences, they're going for broad audiences, similar yeah. to when network television launched. Yes, absolutely. So listen, I want to thank you for being here today. Thank I'm you. sure everybody else would like to thank you as well. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And I think we've actually done this sort of to perfect time. So thank you, everybody. Please thank Francis. Thank Sterling. you very much, Kevin.